Please be seated. I wonder if you know the story of the Fisher King. It's an Arthurian legend in which a wounded king of the land is so injured, so, so hurt, that all he can do is fish and wait for a fellow warrior or knight to come and heal him. And he's so wounded he is unable to honor his sacred charge to go and find the cup that Jesus used at the Last Supper, to find the Holy Grail. Now, after the eight o'clock, a certain someone who will remain unmentioned said, Joanne, you lost me right there when you said Holy Grail. All I could think of was Monty Python. <laughs> so this is not that. So stay with me, friends, okay? Because there are very many virgins, versions of this, of this legend, uh, but the one that I know goes like this. The king, as a boy, had to spend the night in the forest to prove that he had the courage and the mettle to grow up to become a king. But he's afraid and it's dark, so he lights a fire for warmth, for company to help light the night. And in that flame, as he gazed into it, he was visited by a holy vision. There in the fire, he saw the holy grail. And a voice said to the boy, you shall be the keeper of the holy grail, the cup of Christ, so it shall heal the hearts of all. And the boy was amazed and dazzled by the vision. And he thought to himself, if the grail, then why not more? And he had visions of a life full of power and glory that would bring him great honor and beauty in the eyes of the people. And transfixed by his imaginings, he thought himself invincible. He felt himself godlike, so he reached into the fire to take the grail, and the grail vanished. And all that was in the fire was his hand. Now, badly, badly burned. The boy grew older. He did become a king, but he was still terribly wounded, and the wound grew deeper, and it ashamed him. Even so, he was determined still to reclaim his destiny to find the grail. He searched, he traveled, but nothing. Soon his, his kingdom fell into neglect and disrepair. Things started to spoil in the fields. His people suffered. Now the bravest of knights, they went out to try to find the grail, to heal their king. And they sought the grail that would make them the most respected and valued people in all of the land. Finding such a vessel of power became a ruthless struggle between ambitious men. But for the king, life began to lose its reason. He couldn't love or feel loved. He had no faith in any man, not even himself. God became a question. Why bother? He was so sick with this experience. But one day, a fool, a jester, wandered into the castle because it was no longer guarded as it had been once upon a time, and he found the king alone. Now, the fool, being a fool, he was simple-minded, so he didn't see a king he saw a man, alone, wounded, and very sad. What ails you, my friend, the fool called out, and the king said, ah, I'm sad, I'm, I'm thirsty. And the fool lightly danced his way to the bedside. How can I help you then? He said, well, 
I just need some water to cool my throat. So the fool hopped up. Ah! A simple task for a simple man. He danced out of the room, down the stairs, into the scullery, where there was a well of water, and there from the dusty shelves he grabbed a wooden cup, filled it with water, brought it up, sloshing to his new friend, and gave it to the king to drink. And the king drank the water. And as he drank, he saw that the burn was beginning to heal. He finished the water, and his hand was entirely healed. He looked at his hands, and there in his grasp was a single wooden cup. But it was the Holy Grail, that which he had sought all his life. And he gazed at the fool, and he said, How is it that you found the Holy Grail, the cup of Christ that I have sought for all my life? And the fool said to him, Oh, my Lord, I was not looking for a grail. I only knew that you were thirsty. To love and tend one another as Christ is important beyond measure and not glamorous at all. Let me share with you this. Early in my training for ministry, I served as a chaplain in a large city hospital in New Haven, Connecticut. And it served the university community, and it served the ghetto, and all of the metro area and beyond, all sorts of people. And I had my rounds, and I had my floors, and I was to go room to room to room, and I did my very best. And in one room, there was a very important man who would greet me in an unfriendly manner entirely. He was important, and he was grouchy, not particularly faithful, and had no time for me. But I was determined that I would get this done. So I went <clears throat> pressed and professional to the door, all pulled together, carrying my prayer book with the gold cross on the outside to be seen as I came to the room to speak to the man of the love of Christ. And when I got there, just then, the cart rolled up with the lunch trays. And the woman who worked in food service for decades, I expect, took the tray off of the uh, rack and walked past me, morning pastor, in her green uniform, which was cotton. It was so old, it was still actually cotton. And it was, it was frayed at the edges, and she was wearing canvas shoes that barely had any soles left on them. She was missing a few teeth, but she went right up to that man. She put the tray down on his bedside tra table. She slid that table in front of him, and then she took his long, elegant, important hands in her gnarled, dark brown ones, grabbed them tight, looked him in the eye, and said, God bless you, child. Now you have something to eat. <laughs> and she left. And I just stood there, recognizing that to tend and love another as Christ is important beyond measure and not glamorous at all. And we know this. We know this. We give intellectual assent to this with the very best of intentions. We do. We do. And yet, poet and priest Malcolm Geit has written a beautiful sonnet, it's on your bulletin, that will remind us of how sometimes we respond to Christ the King really. The sonnet says this. Our king is calling from hungry furrows whilst we are cruising through aisles of plenty. Our hoardings screen us from the man of sorrows. Our soundtracks drown out his murmur, I am thirsty. He stands in line as a stranger and seek a welcome from the world he made. We only see him as a threat, a danger. He asks for clothes. We strip search him instead. 
And if he should fall sick, then we take care that he does not infect our private health. We lock him in the prisons of our fear, lest he unlock the prison of our wealth. But still on Sunday, we shall stand and sing the praises of our hidden Lord and King. We mean the best. We really do. But this gospel today is important beyond measure, so important that there are words written by St. John Chrysostom, who wrote this down in the first centuries of the church that are quoted to this day to remind us on this occasion, do you wish to honor the body of the Savior? Do not despise it when it is naked. Do not honor it in church with silk vestments while outside leaving it numb and cold and naked. He who said, this is my body, makes it so by his word, is the same who said, you saw me hungry and you gave me nothing to eat. As you did not do it to the least of these, you did not do it to me. So honor him then by sharing your property. For what God needs is not golden chalices, but golden souls. The light of Christ shines in the darkness of our souls with an importance beyond measure. But that goldenness within us does not make us glamorous at all. Now, last week, I spoke to you of the words over the door at the entrance of the church, ask and imagine. Today, I would bring your attention to the banner at the back of the church. You can turn right around and look at it. That's on the banner, St. Lawrence's words. It's, it's on your website. It's even on the little table tents with the cream and sugar at coffee hour. The people are the treasure of the church. That is your chosen credo of importance. The people are the treasure of the church. That is a complex commitment and the purpose of this property. The people are the treasure of the church. Sacred vessels, you. Holy grail, you. Only, truthfully, we are only so many wooden cups. Not glamorous at all. And yet, in this place, and from this place, to tend and love one another and another and another and another is our calling up to which we must measure here and now, outward and onward, the reign of Christ lives on in us to see and tend Christ in all, in all, in all, and all. Go forth and be the Christ who reigns.